I was told by a podcast consultant, uh, I had a, just a, a quick conversation with one a little while ago. You obviously know that, the listeners don't. But uh, he said that just one criticism he has of the podcast is that you and I ramble on occasionally about things that aren't very pertinent to the subject matter a little too much. He said, you introduced this man-eating tiger and then you started talking about what aftershave you were using. Are you kidding? That was my favourite bit. (laughs) I know. He did say, I completely appreciate this. It's probably just stylistically what you're going for. But for me, it was a little too long. (laughs) Um, I spoke with a Tenafor expert today. I saw a little part of the interaction on Twitter, yeah. Yes, I showed him the animated clip of the ephemeral anus that captured our imagination Mm. last episode. I also asked him whether he preferred the term ephemeral anus or transient anus, and he he hasn't got back to me. Oh. So maybe he's just a bit affronted with that question. We Mm. are strangers after all. True. But um, did you see his research? I thought it was really interesting. Um, Well, I, I read it, but I didn't really take any of it in. Okay, well, I'll explain it as far as I understand it. So you and I have spoken about Hox genes before. Oh, we spoke yeah. about them in the uh, the Shimmer episode because they were mentioned in that movie. Um, and these are the genes that map out the body plan. They say things like put an arm here, put an eyeball here, etc., etc. So apparently tenophores have got a famous lack of Hox genes. It's like, where are their Hox genes? What, why are they not there? Um, which makes them really difficult to understand. And scientists have struggled to understand them while studying them. Um, but it turns out that over evolutionary time, the body region of the tenophore, or the bit of us that is the body in the tenophore, that, that, the analogue, mm. um, has reduced significantly. Whereas the oral disc, a region analogous to our lips, have ballooned to enormous proportions. So the majority of the tenophore are actually the lips that have just been appropriated by evolution to form what looks like a body plan to us. Wow. Yeah, that's very strange. And obviously because the majority of Hox genes are found in the body, the tenophores have very few. Wow. Mm, I thought that was fascinating. Yeah. A bit jealous that they've got such big lips, but... <laughs> yes, you've got famously very tiny lips. Very, very small. I'll put a link to the study in the show notes. And uh, for reference, the author I was speaking to was Jakob Winter, if I've said that correctly. Uh, I'll put a link to his Twitter handle as well in the show notes. Oh, very nice. Yeah. So you weren't impressed with the first ever picture of a black hole. Oh, is this not one of your main stories? No, I, I'm not going to do it as one of my main stories for two reasons. One reason, everybody's doing it. That's true. The second reason is black holes are so complex to understand. I'm not a physicist. I, I, I find them fascinating, that's true. But I fear I wouldn't be able to do them justice. Well, everyone else is doing it. I don't think the picture does them justice. I think the picture's crap. Yeah, you do, don't you? I do. Why do you think that? I don't know. Sometimes you just, uh, you know, don't you? Like, you go to an art gallery and you say, mm, this is good, this isn't good. And I'm just saying, I just don't think it's very good. Like, as far as pictures go, I know that they're taking a picture of something, which, well, it's very big in real life, but like in the sky, in terms of like what we would be able to see of it, is very small. I read it's the equivalent of viewing a mustard seed in Brussels from Washington, D.C., that's how small it is in the sky. And to create yeah, the picture... Yeah, but we're not doing that, are we? No, but if we did do that, that would be amazing. Yeah. That would be an amazing accomplishment. Like, even seeing that picture, even if it wasn't the most clear picture, to think, wow, the distance we covered to, to take a picture of that tiny object mm. over all that distance. And that's not even considering that this is the first ever image of a black hole or... Not the black hole, the accretion disk around it. Well, yeah, this is another thing, isn't it? Like, before, with our understanding of black holes, right, we knew they mm-hmm. had to be there because of measurements we'd taken and, and theories that we'd come up with and, like, it, it fit the, the, the data, right? Yeah. I just, I just don't know what this is adding, like, what, what is the great benefit of having this picture? Because you still don't see the black hole. You just see an illusion. 
<laughs> you see the the effect of the black hole mm. on the surrounding space and the matter in that surrounding space. I think that's what's so incredible, though. As somebody who's struggled to even photograph something as big as Jupiter in the past, <laughs> I think it's astonishing that we have an image of a supermassive black hole at the centre of M87, which is more than 50 million light years away from Earth. I just think it's crazy. You know, it, and just to explain as well how they did it, I'm sure you've, you've read it, but mm -hmm. to create the picture, the Event Horizon Telescope had to use observatories all around the world to create essentially a, a telescope with an aperture the size of the Earth's diameter. Uh, it's obviously an incredible feat that required lots of coordination from lots of different people. I think the, the files from uh, like a telescope in New Zealand or something, I, I can't remember the location, they, the files were so big that they couldn't transfer them over the internet and they had to ship them on actual physical hard drives to um, wherever the images were being compiled. <laughs> mm, wow okay yes it's not the most aesthetically pleasing image of all time but um for all we understand of space and and our our position in it with things like gravity and laws of thermodynamics and general relativity like all of that stuff's fine and it's so complex to wrap your head around and then once you finally understand it, it all seems to make sense. But then there are these points in space where all of our understanding of, of everything breaks down and it just doesn't make sense. And you have these points in space that bending space-time so severely that time and light just become completely warped. It's crazy. It's mm. crazy. I can't believe you've made me talk about this in the introduction. After the first time ever, I've I, I thought about what I've done this week. Oh, no. Well, I was just going to ask you, actually, what have you been up to? Oh, OK. Well, yesterday I became very distracted with the idea of growing microfungi for mycoprotein. For, like, corn? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm telling you, like, it's going to be the next big thing. Like, you, you know, there was <laughs> uh, craft brewing and all that. Yeah. Mycoprotein is next. You mean people growing it themselves? Well, yeah, or me, or me just doing it, me starting my own, like, little shop. So that's what you've been up to, pondering over mycoprotein. Yeah, basically. What about you? In the meantime, I've been on BBC Radio 1. Oh, yes, of course. Talking about the ultra-low emission zone, ULES, in London. Yeah, talking about pollution and living in the city with asthma. Mm. I kind of only signed up because I was hoping they'd let me plug the podcast. <laughs> Oh, it's very choppy on news, be attentive. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, alas, I, I didn't even get to do it. I, was, I said, um, oh, you know, I, I am I'm a science podcaster, so if you don't mind saying Harvey Broadhurst, 28, science podcaster at Generic Drift or something like that, and they were like, we'll probably just use your name and age. <laughs> so I was already too far gone. Oh, I had to sort but, of, you know. Yeah, I had to do it. All, it's all content. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> all right, it's dinosaur time. If I ask you to imagine a dinosaur habitat, what do you picture? Well, I guess the answer you're looking for is sort of um, like ferns, but also sort of dry. Okay, and that's warm. interesting. For me, it's hot, humid, lots of water because of the high sea levels. Quite swampy, I would say. Well, they're, they're everywhere, aren't they? They were in the yeah. water. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, I guess, yeah, the hot plains, the forests, very green, very hot. Yeah. But of course, like you say, like the Earth during the Mesozoic had many different habitats, just mm -hmm. like it does today. And we've even previously touched upon dinosaurs living in the desert regions right camel analogs exactly but um you don't really hear about many dinosaurs living in the arctic do you no i guess you don't you, because you wouldn't really associate dinosaurs with the cold yeah because i would i didn't know how much ice cap there was at the time i guess it would be the arctic regions colder than the equator sure but not as cold as it is today yeah but then of course the descendants of dinosaurs birds 
They're very good at living in the cold. Animals like snowy owls, terns, puffins. Penguins. And of course, penguins. Yeah, yeah penguins are the, are the obvious ones. Uh, and they've all adapted to life in the polar regions where it's extremely cold. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Potentially better than any other animals, really. Particularly in Antarctica, where I think uh, there's no mammals that live on the land, are there? Rats are doing pretty well. Oh, yes. Okay. Since humans introduced them. Yeah. yeah. No, you're right. But the birds, the birds have done really well. So obviously there were Arctic dinosaurs and we've known this for quite a while, actually. Um, So in North Slope in Alaska, which is a region within the Arctic Circle, Mm. there's a quarry where 6,000 hadrosaur fossils have been found. So these are the duck-billed dinosaurs. Ah. They're a really diverse group, quite poorly represented in the media, I'd say. You don't really see them in Jurassic Park or anything, but they're great looking animals. And things you know? with a bill can still be scary. Yeah, sure. Like a goose. Yeah. So these things had, as their name suggests, flattened rostral bones, basically a, a bill, and it quite duck-like. And they were used to clip leaves and twigs where then they'd obviously that food matter would be passed back into the, the back of the mouth where there were lots and lots of teeth to mash it down. Um, Another identifying feature in one group of hadrosaurs was the presence of a massive crest on the top of its head, which is generally assumed to be for display, as we see in many modern birds. But as with all of these things, you never really do know, do you? (laughs) Um, But back to Alaska, 99% of the fossils excavated from this quarry, uh, which is part of the Lizcombe bone bed, they are non-crested duck-billed dinosaurs. Um, so no crests, pretty boring. Yeah, no um, But the new discovery of an unusual skull fragment has found that actually there were other dinosaurs in the region too. And the species doesn't have a name yet. Um, I'm not sure if you can give it a name just from a skull fragment. Perhaps you can. Mm. I'm not sure. But um, anyway, this one, it was a species of Lambiosaurine, which is the crested duck-billed dinosaurs. While this region is within the Arctic Circle... Uh, It's worth mentioning that the region was obviously warmer and more forested during the late Cretaceous, um, but it was still quite nippy. Temperatures were around 4 degrees centigrade or 40 Fahrenheit. Oh, that's freezing. Well, I mean, not literally, but like pretty close. (laughs) It's the average winter temperature in the UK, apparently. So that is pretty cold. Okay. Oh, it's not as bad as I thought, but... Well, it's pretty cold. I would have got used to it. Hmm... It's worth noting that the paleontologists haven't found any cold-blooded animals in this region, so no lizards, turtles, or crocodiles. Um, so it's quite likely that these dinosaurs were able to regulate their own body temperature, warm-blooded, or something similar. That is interesting. Yeah, so at least four unique dinosaur species have been confirmed in the region, with likely a few more on the way, perhaps as many as a dozen. Uh, but basically it just shows how diverse um, other regions of of the Cretaceous were, and that you would have, you know, potentially as many as a dozen different dinosaur species, duck-billed, non-duck-billed, all living together in the Arctic. So there you go. Dinosaur of the Month is an unclassified polar hadrosaur. What's the deadliest animal in the world? By which, I mean, it kills the most humans. The mosquito. Oh, well, you've hit the nail on the head. Brilliant. Yes, I knew it. This is number one, according to uh, something to do with Bill Gates, Bill Gates Foundation. Oh, yeah. Uh, Apparently, mosquitoes kill 725,000 people per year. Uh, By being vectors for malaria. And, you know, other other bad diseases. Do you want to go through the top five deadliest animals? Okay, so mosquitoes, number one. Nile crocodile? No. Oh, is there anything big and charismatic? Uh, crocodile is number eight, kills a thousand people a year. Okay, so this is like confirmed deaths, because actually I've read a long time ago that Nile crocodiles are probably responsible for many deaths, but they go unreported because they're in quite remote areas of um, Africa. So there you ah. go, there's a nice little fact for you. Well, how many people do you think die in remote corners of Africa of malaria and it doesn't get reported? Yeah, that's true. But so I also, think up against the mosquito, it's, it's you know, still doing okay. Yeah, okay. Um, do you want me to tell you how many people it kills? And then that might help you. Yeah, go on. Just under half a million a year on oh, average. Half a million people a year? 
killed by this animal? Is it quite an easy one, would you say? Do you think you would guess it? Uh, yeah, but it's easy to say that when it's written down in front of you. Not a rat? No. Is it another one carrying diseases? No, I think this is from pure aggression. Oh my god, half a million people a year. According from, to Bill Gates. From pure aggression. Half a million is so many people. Yeah, it is, right? Is it snakes? Uh, snakes kill 50,000 a year. They're number three. So more dangerous than snakes, but less dangerous than mosquitoes you're looking for. I feel like Bruce Forsyth. Spiders. No. What? Good lord. Oh, for goodness sake. Yeah. Humans. Yes, there we are. <laughs> yeah, humans are the number two deadliest animal. Oh my god. And then I'll quickly finish up the top five. So first we have mosquitoes, then humans, then snakes. Then um, fourth, 25,000 people per year is dogs. Oh yeah, okay. So that, I guess that's a mix of dog attacks and rabies. And then joint fifth, uh, about 10,000 people per year. So it's a joint win for the freshwater snails that transmit schistosomiasis, the assassin bug that uh, spreads Chagas disease, and the sexy fly, which does sleeping sickness. Oh, okay. So th there we are. Sorry that we um, dwelled for so long <laughs> on that, but it was supposed to be a qu little quick introduction, but you guessed the answer. I'll cut that down significantly, but it will still be painful for our listeners. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So just as a little side note about mosquitoes, do you know where the name mosquito comes from? Mosquito. It sounds Spanish. Yeah, it's just Spanish for little fly. So mosca is fly from, from the Latin mosca, like mosca domesticus, yeah, the house fly. And ito just means little, so like burrito. What's that, a little? Donkey. Little, oh, yeah, it is a little donkey, of yeah, course. And, uh, or Chiquito is little boy. Yes, Chiquito. And Chiquita is a little girl. Yeah, so Mosquito, little fly. Little fly. Nice. That's really just, nice little factoid. Thank you. Yeah, I just thought that was a bit interesting. But these little flies, uh, obviously, they can cause big problems, most notably malaria, which uh, I read some stats from UNICEF, and they say kills a child every 30 seconds. Okay. Yes, and 300 to 600 million people suffer from malaria every year. Uh, so malaria is caused by Anopheles mosquitoes, uh, but not all Anopheles mosquitoes. There are about 460 species, and only about 100 of them can transmit malaria, and only 30 or 40 do so very regularly. Okay. There are uh, different mosquitoes that transmit a host of other terrible diseases. So, so like the Aedes mosquitoes, they're quite... A famous big group of them. It's about 950 and they spread like yellow fever and dengue fever. Oh, dengue fever. Yeah, of course. Yeah, chicken, yeah. chicken gun, yeah. Encephalitis? Or is that a tick? That's a tick, I think, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. This, Zika. Ah, yes, Zika, of course. Mm. So, like, one of the most critical challenges that we face as a humanity, I'm sure you'll agree, is how to deal with these diseases, right? I mean, some of them have vaccines. Like, I think dengue and yellow fever both have relatively safe and good vaccines malaria uh, as well right well yeah the rtss is the malaria one but i don't it's not as effective as we want it to be at the moment mm -hmm. like it's it's still in development really you can take tablets though can't you to yeah reduce significantly reduce your risk of contracting malaria yeah i mean obviously there's uh, nothing for zika at the moment either but is there not uh, a zika vaccine no oh right other than vaccines, I guess you've got bed nets. They're always touted as a practical solution, right? Especially for malaria, because the mosquitoes are around at night. But like with the ADs mosquitoes, that's not very good for you because in the day, you don't have to be sitting in bed all day under your bed net, do you? So, so one group of mosquitoes attacks during the night and one attacks during the day. I think it's more species specific than that, even like. Right. But yeah, of course, they occupy similar niches. Mm. So they're not they're going to be temporarily spaced out, yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So there mm. really is no protecting against it. Like that, you get it on all fronts. Yeah, that's crazy. And then, of course, we've got insecticides. Mm -hmm. So stuff like DEET that you can put on you, and it makes you less appealing or 
or like more fully full scale integrated vector control programs. But the problem is we've been using all these insecticides for decades and just like we've seen with antibiotic resistance, like mosquitoes have the capacity to resolve resistance to these insecticides, yeah. And they're really bad for the environment. Oh, and yeah, on top of that, on top of the fact that they might not even work forever, you've got all the negatives mm. for biodiversity and like the collateral damage of insecticides on the ecosystem, yeah. So what are we going to do, eh? Um, I don't know, I guess more research into vaccines vaccines are the answer aren't they see if you still think the vaccine's the answer after this news story so a new paper in acta tropica has an idea it's a sort of three-pronged attack so after this treatment the mosquitoes visit a host significantly slower and less the level of blood feeding that they do is reduced so they bite you less and take your blood less mm. and they copulate less wow okay so, you know, produce less for the next generation, right? Sounds mm-hmm. pretty promising. It does yeah. sound good. So here's the experiment they did then. You get a little box of mosquitoes, give them a restrained hamster to have a nibble on. <laughs> a restrained hamster? That is literally how it is referred to in the paper. Oh, poor hamster. Box of mosquitoes, restrained hamster, and then you play them some Skrillex. Oh, yes. I saw Are you familiar head- with Skrillex? Is that oh. a fan? <laughs> No, not really. Um, Not really a big dubstep fan, actually. Yeah, no, neither were the mosquitoes. (laughs) I saw the headline for this and I thought it was quite funny, but I didn't read the article. Um, So explain to me, how how did this come about? Like, is this... It's very unclear. (laughs) Right. Well, so, okay. It isn't actually the first study of its kind. Like there was a group uh, last year that published about ladybirds, which uh, when played ACDC, Mm. reduced their predation on aphids. So I don't think the mechanism for the effect is like really well understood, but um, some people have suggested it's just masking of acoustic signals. Some people have suggested that the noise just induces stress. But yeah, I don't think it's, it's completely figured out. Also, if you're something as small as a mosquito, you know, and you fly around, you might actually be severely impacted by these travelling sound waves. Mm. I don't know how loud they were playing it, to be honest, but... Um... Did they try a different type of music? No, just just this, just Skrillex. <laughs> okay, so what they found is playing Skrillex has this effect on mosquitoes, but they can't say with any certainty that it's anything unique about Skrillex. It could just be music. That's true. So those of you who are listening who are unfamiliar with Skrillex... Like, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. He's kind of... Uh, what, what is it? E- electronica? Dubstep? It is dubstep, isn't it? I think it's dubstep. and he's But he's quite alternative, yeah, isn't he? Yeah, it sounds... Like the dinosaur of the month jingle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do, do, do. It's all it that. Is, it is very much like that. Wasn't he in another band? I thought he was like the drummer in a an aggressive band. From first know. to last, yeah. Oh no, he was the lead singer of From First to Last, who were like a bit of an emo y, screamy, post hardcore band. Um mm. but yeah, and then he went off to start a solo electronic project he got some success with the song bangarang which was uh, quite popular when you and i were at university i remember yeah, bangarang bass yeah wap yeah. wap chicka chicka wap wap i wish i could play some but i'm sure his music is copyrighted um mm. so i can't i i'm glad that you can't yeah it's i'm, it's, I'm not a big fan either so but... so yeah let, back to the mosquitoes mm, please uh so when the music's playing they take about three times as long to visit the hamster at first. Mm-hmm. Uh, they visit the hamster half as many times, feed on them half as many times, and have about as fifth as much sex. So these are quite significant reductions, yeah? Mm-hmm. But to be fair, like, I'm not sure that I could eat with it on either. <laughs> I, I mean, I certainly couldn't copulate. <laughs> I could, I knew that was coming. Yeah, no, <laughs> you're right. What was the other thing they couldn't do? They don't feed as much, they don't copulate as much, and 
Well, this yeah, they're slower to attack. Though. Slower to attack. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, it's it would be very off-putting. I understand, <laughs> but it is interesting. I wonder what genuine effect this is having, like what measurable effects this is having on the mosquitoes physiology or behavior like yeah well we know what it's what effect it's having on its behavior but why yeah i know what you're talking about like so we know that just playing the music is leading to the effect of them you know having sex less often but we, we don't know literally what it is about the music playing like mm. it's not because they don't like it for example could be well it could be yeah the song if you want to have a listen to it listeners is um it's called Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites. Oh, okay. I think yeah. I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, I think no. it's quite famous. Let me have a listen. Oh, I do know this one. Oh, this is taking me back, actually. Yeah, so it's quite, it's, it's like a noisy song, right? Yeah, it's noisy. There's a constant wall of sound. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like e- easy listening song where there's periods of silence. There's always going to be some sort of electronic noise. And it's always like changing, right? Mm. So I I can kind of understand why they chose this style of music. Mm. Yeah, I guess I can too. I can imagine them flying around quite nicely to a bit of Al Gore. <laughs> Nora Jones. I recently mm-hmm. rediscovered Nora Jones. I I could eat and other things to Nora Jones. Barry White. Barry White. <laughs> yeah. Marvin Gaye, let's get it no, on. No, there'd be too much bass with Barry White, so it'd affect the flying if that's your hypothesis. There you go, so we can we can do this experiment. We can, yeah, exactly. All we need is some hamsters. <laughs> and some tiny hamster tethers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Skrillex himself retweeted the news. Yeah, of course. And he said, everything feels like April Fool's. It was April the 1st, I should add. Uh, and then a few days later, he followed up with... No more mosquitoes, man. My timeline looks so nasty. Vom emoji. (laughs) And then his final words on the subject were, science icon. (laughs) I really like the guy. Do you? Yeah. He sounds a bit like you. Ugh, no mosquito pictures, please. Well, I'm I'm sure there are nasty ones out there. So what what do you think then? A good method for solving the mosquito-borne disease problem? Get a little (laughs) boombox? No. No. I don't think so, because just as easily as these mosquitoes can adapt to cope with insecticides, (laughs) Skrillex's effect on certain mosquitoes is placing them under a selective pressure to evolve to be able to cope with Skrillex's music. And actually, you could, I guess you could say then that you would start to develop a bit of an insect fan base for Skrillex. (laughs) Yeah, but so say, I mean, I'm just, I keep going back to this hypothesis that you floated, like this, it being the vibration of the air, yeah, which disrupts the flying, which I'm not sure, I'm, I think they could fly around pretty easily, but if it is something like that, then the way to overcome that, the way for them to become adapted to it would be some sort of, uh, some sort of change that would be maladaptive when Skrillex was turned off. Mm, or even when he got turned down, right? Because you'd constantly be accounting for the i don't know you're assuming that this would be some sort of physiological adaptation that enables it to fly better through these waves Mm. it could just be something as simple as the mosquito changing the hours in which it hunts humans because a human is not going to listen to skrillex 24 7 to avoid mosquitoes yes that's very true yeah it also it doesn't solve the night time thing but you've got your bed net for that so (laughs) that's net at night skrillex during the day There was a bit of talk about black holes earlier on, and there's quite a lot of public interest in it at the moment, especially in light of the picture of the supermassive black hole at the centre of Messier 87. Now this reignited a hunger in me to learn more about what black holes are and some of the most recent developments in black hole theory. So I recently read the book Black Holes, A Very Short Introduction by Catherine Blundell. As the title suggests, it's not very long, only about 100 pages, but actually the subject matter covered in those pages is enormous from basic stuff like how black holes distort and curve space-time to why they look the way they do, and even to crazy mathematical predictions of wormholes and white holes. You'll learn about Hawking radiation, quasars, and the powerful relativistic jets ejected from black holes at close to light speed. It's super crazy stuff, neatly packaged in a really enjoyable book. So if you do fancy learning all about black holes, check out the Amazon affiliate link in the show notes, and know that you will also be supporting the podcast. 
And if you fancy seeing any of our other book recommendations, check out genericdrift.com. Thanks a bunch. Do you wear any jewellery, Adam? I w- oh, I wear an earring. Ah, yes, you do. What's your okay. earring like? Uh, um, you know, those ones that you get at the checkout at Top Man. A bit of plastic. Mm. Yeah. No diamonds. No diamonds. No, I, I can't afford diamonds. And I think it makes me look young. What, the earring? Or desperate to be young. Me too. I don't wear my earring anymore. I mm. I, I took it out because I was told it wasn't professional enough for, for work. By my, my previous agency, not where I am at the moment. Um, and also, when I put it back in now, occasionally, because Bella likes it, I just can't <laughs> sleep with it. It pokes into my... I don't know how I ever did it. But anyway, I digress. Mm. So, uh, no diamonds. I don't, I don't really wear any jewellery. Uh, I, I wear a watch. That's all. Um, yeah. But this month, I don't know if you've seen this. You probably haven't. The luxury jeweller, Graf has unveiled what is being touted as the world's largest square emerald cut diamond. Do you want to see it? Yeah, for Graf is the name of the jewellery company. I've never heard of that at all. Graf, yeah. How are you Luck- spelling that? G-R-A-F-F. Okay. Yeah, I'm not familiar with them. I knew about De Beers, but that's, I think, probably the only one that I know. So here it is. Here's a picture of it. It is 302.37 carat. Oh, there's so many pop-ups on this bloody website, Forbes. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's nice. How big are we talking in um, surface area, volume? If you scroll down, you'll see a picture of a lady holding it. Okay. Yeah, I thought there'd be bigger diamonds than this in the world. This is the, the biggest square emerald cut diamond. So actually, it's the biggest of that particular cut, that shape. And also, of course, there are rough diamonds that are bigger than it. uh, that have just been plucked out of the ground. Um, But to cut one of this size is apparently quite a task. Um, So it's D colour. I don't know if you know anything about diamonds, but that means it's got um, no colour whatsoever when it's a Mm. D rated colour diamond. And it's a high clarity stone. They haven't revealed its actual grade, but it's it has no real occlusions or blemishes within the diamond itself, or or very very few of them. So it's incredible. Apparently, this is um, crazily rare for any diamond to have these features, let alone one of this size and weight. Hmm. So, for a bit more background on this one, this is the principal diamond cut and polished from the Lazidi La Rona rough diamond, which was 1,109 carats. So this is 302.37. Right. The rough diamond was the second largest discovered in history, exceeded only by a 3,017 carat diamond mined in South Africa in 1905, which produced nine diamonds for the British crown jewels. Of course it did. Mm, of course, back then. 1905 we we were Mm. having everything and the one that this one was cut from was the second largest in history graf purchased the rough diamond for do you want to have a guess how much the rough diamond cost 17 million it is a lot more than that it was 53 million right uh so they they purchased it in 2017 for 53 million and they've now cut it into the aforementioned big old emerald cut diamond as well as 66 smaller what they call satellite diamonds so 67 diamonds came out of that rough diamond one of which is the biggest whatever it is emerald cut ever yeah uh so what do you think of all that yeah i guess it's nice for rich people to have things (laughs) but it doesn't really affect me at all does it do you know much about diamonds? I know that it's well, it's carbon, isn't it, in a, a lattice formation? Yes. Under high pressure. So this is actually what put me on to this uh, topic because mm. I read an article on how diamonds form because I kind of already had an idea like it was carbon just crushed in pressure and temperature, but yeah. I didn't really understand it. In the first two billion years of Earth's history... Obviously, the composition of the Earth was completely different to how it is now. It was a lot hotter. Tectonic plates and all sorts were very different. Mm-hmm. Um, and in the early, very early Earth, there were no tectonic plates. So in the first two billion years, 
there was specific temperatures and tremendous pressures in Earth's mantle that atomically transformed graphite, which is a crystalline form of carbon. Yeah, hence all stuff. That's right, yeah. But it's, it's just carbon and it forms into a crystal. Yeah. Now, under this pressure and temperature, its molecular composition is transformed from a hexagonal sheet pattern into a triangular shape. And that's all a diamond is. Mm. It's just graphite transformed into diamond through atomic mangling. Uh, then over time, obviously, there's not much good having these diamonds in the uh, mantle of the earth because humans can't access the mantle. Yet. That's true, yes. Um, but over time, volcanic processes create these geological pipes that bring the diamonds to the surface in a liquid magma. And then humans eventually find them and marvel at their beauty, hmm. which is quite amazing. Like the, you have these, uh, I guess, tubes of magma, and that's apparently what prospectors look for. They look for these tubes and they're like, oh, brilliant, we'll find some diamonds in here. So I thought that was quite amazing, quite an amazing process. Yeah. And that's actually the process by which it's believed almost 100% of diamonds on Earth were formed. But it's worth mentioning that tectonic movements have been attributed with the formation of very small diamonds, I guess because they create temperatures and pressures. And also NASA have detected diamonds in meteorites um, out in space, which can obviously bring them to Earth when they crash into the planet. Yeah, I have heard about space diamonds. Also, also one last process by which diamonds can be formed is asteroid impacts. Um, so when an asteroid collides with the Earth, obviously that creates lots of temperature and pressure. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, apparently diamond fragments or very small diamonds have been found at known impact craters. And it's not really known where the carbon is, but obviously carbon is abundant everywhere. It could yeah, be coal. Yeah, plenty of carbon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I think you've missed one, though. What's that? Go on. Do you remember the advert that used to be on TV where somebody, somebody dies in this advert and then a family member takes them to this place and gets them turned into a tooth diamond? A tooth diamond? Yeah, you know, I think they like they turn the carbon from you into a diamond. Hmm. So I think we can synthetically do it. Yeah. I know that we, you can have a, a relative turned into a piece of jewelry. Some people will have them on their ring or something. Yeah, I think it was. Uh, I don't. I don't think many people went for the tooth gem. <laughs> diamond <laughs> tooth gem, <laughs> auntie or whatever. Oh my god! <laughs> a little ear stud. Oh. <laughs> Take it out, it's unprofessional I also don't understand how they just extract the carbon from you Because humans are not just carbon Like finding graphite somewhere and then crushing that into diamond makes sense Because it's just pure carbon But with a human, you're crushing all sorts of elements together, aren't you? You probably don't get a, a very, well not a perfect diamond anyway Yeah, probably not But anyway, those are the natural There's a bit of gold in you Yeah, exactly The card, you know but those are the natural processes by which diamonds can be formed. Apparently, the problem for geologists has been that the prevailing theory for the thermal evolution of the early Earth is that the whole mantle was significantly hotter until about 2.5 billion years ago. But under these conditions, diamonds wouldn't have formed. It would have been too hot and they would have simply just melted into graphite. Mm -hmm. So apparently... Lots of geologists have been puzzled as, like, how were these diamonds actually formed? But a new study, and this is the one that I found um, from this month, looked at magnesium oxide levels in volcanic rocks, and it found that while the lower mantle was indeed 2.5 to 3 times as hot as it is now, the upper mantle was no hotter than it is today. So there was a huge discrepancy in the heat from the lower mantle to the upper mantle. And the analogy that the researchers used to explain this is, imagine turning up the radiators in your bedroom, but also opening all the windows. So loads more heat is being produced, but actually lots of it is being lost. This new evidence for the cool upper mantle also helps to explain how the tectonic plates were moving so fast um, in the early Earth's evolution. So the churning rocks below would have been moving them around. They'd have been like essentially floating on top. And uh, that caused lots of collisions, essentially shaping our world today. And while at the same time producing those little diamonds that we value so highly. Hmm. 
So I thought that was quite a cool little story about how diamonds are formed and how old they are, basically. Yeah, and our new understanding, yeah, of a, a solved riddle. How did the diamonds get there? So with that in mind, and you kind of uh, mentioned this earlier on, how do you feel about synthetic diamonds? And to clarify what these are, these are not imitation diamonds, which are like cubic zirconia or moissanite. So those are things that look like diamonds, but actually aren't um, just pure carbon structures. Synthetic diamonds have exactly the same chemical properties of real diamonds, but they're not formed in the mantle of the earth, but instead made in the lab. Mm -hmm. You knew this was a thing, right? Yeah, obviously I'm, well, yeah, I'm on board. Let's, the rich people devalue everything that we own. So why shouldn't we do it to them? <laughs> That's brilliant. I'm honestly, if I could do it, I'd make so many diamonds and I'd just give them to everyone and be like, there you go. <laughs> just to uh, devalue yeah. the things that rich people enjoy. That's yeah. Uh, yeah, that's great. I love that. I'd be up for that too. I think we should put significant money into that. There are, and yeah, there are quite a few synthetic diamond companies that I guess you could say are doing that. But not as maliciously as I was uh, <laughs> suggesting. Perhaps. I think it, it is still quite expensive to produce yeah. them, but not as expensive as, as sourcing them from the ground. So we've used synthetic diamonds since the 1950s, mainly for industrial processes like creating drill components. I was going to uh, say diamond drill tips, yeah. Yeah, because that's it's such a strong material. But recently they've begun to make good headway into the jewellery market, um, which is obviously much to the chagrin of the big diamond retailers. Yeah. Now, there are two different approaches to creating a synthetic diamond. Number one, you simulate the conditions of mantle formation by inducing high temperatures and pressures within the lab to form carbon or transform carbon into what's called a diamond seed. Uh, and the other approach involves 3D printing the diamond in a vacuum with layers of carbon being applied on top of each other to a, a diamond seed. That sounds cool. Oh, if I could 3D print a diamond. Uh, sorry, Graf, you're finished. <laughs> well, you have to do it in a, in a vacuum as well, I guess, to prevent any other material from being mixed up in there. You don't want a single atom that isn't carbon in there. Wow. If people were getting them for free, they wouldn't complain. <laughs> the complication arises because synthetic diamonds look the same to the naked eye because they are chemically <laughs> identical, right? Uh, and yeah. this has become so much of an issue in places like China where the market's been flooded with these um, synthetic diamonds that De Beers, the diamond company, has invested tens of millions of dollars into diamond identification technology while other retailers have begun printing serial numbers into the real diamonds so that they're easily identifiable. Ridiculous. Yeah, isn't it crazy? You're just making them work. Now I'd prefer to have a fake diamond. <laughs> is that right? Because it's got, it's got a number printed on it. I guess the, the number is literally microscopic, mm. so you would have to have some pretty good equipment to find that identification and verify it. So, yeah, I, I can't find much information about this, but I'm assuming an expert with some sophisticated technology can tell the difference between a synthetic stone and a natural one just by looking at it, basically. But how long is that actually going to be the case? Because all these things are a carbon yeah, smashed together with pressure and temperature. When we replicate that in the lab, I don't understand what the Earth is doing that we can't do. Yeah, surely they're quite dirty when they come out of the Earth as well, right? Yeah, they would be dirty, but I guess you'd clean them up. I mean, a rough diamond is, is quite an ugly thing compared to these cut ones. Mm. And I guess lots of the diamond gets cut away because the ed edges aren't so shiny or whatever. It gets like polished up and cut up. Yeah, so it's like the centre of a bigger piece of rock. Well, not rock, but you know what I mean. Yeah. The real question that I have, and it's, again, something that we talked about earlier on, is where is the value in a diamond? Why are the natural ones more expensive? Well, it's the, it's the same thing as like everything, anything only has value because people agree that it has value, right? Mm hmm. Because that's it. People have agreed that diamonds are valuable. For what purpose? Like, or for, for what reason? Look nice. Now drill bits, but I think literally just because there was something that not everybody can have because they're rare. Mm hmm. And they look nice. Mm hmm. Is, is there another reason? You've, you've kind of alluded to the main reason. The thing is, synthetic diamonds are cheaper than 
naturally found diamonds. I think about 30% cheaper. Yeah. If it was simply they look nice or they're rare, why are the natural ones still more expensive? Because the synthetic ones are just as rare. And in fact, like, let's look at it this way. <laughs> yes, they're rare. And we're told this by the diamond companies, but actually it's not necessarily true. There's an estimated quadrillion tons of diamonds in the earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like there's um, there's loads of gold right in the earth. There's loads of gold in the sea. There's loads of copper. Yeah. But we know the rate at which these precious materials arrive. As soon as we're getting, we perfect a technique to get them out of the ground, we're making the next one to get them further out, yeah? We're getting more and more complicated. The level of, well, obviously now copper's gone through the floor because we've taken too much of it, but like the, the level at which we're accumulating this stuff is like fairly stable, I think, right? That's why gold was used as, for currency for so long and silver, like. Because it was still being readily found. Yeah, but still it was rare, right? And, and it looks nice. People, are, people agree that that can have value. So you don't mind swapping over your cow for a piece of gold. Because mm. you know that somebody else is going to want your gold. The same way now that you don't mind swapping your cow for 50 quid because you know someone else will want 50 quid. But mm. I mean, it's not the same because the 50 quid is worthless. <laughs> yeah, in a way. It doesn't way. represent gold. And people can just decide they don't like 50 quid. Whereas people are... Uh, people throughout history have, have decided they don't want 50 quid more than they've decided they don't want gold because you can put a loaf of bread up to 50 quid. Yeah, yeah, like because currency is subject to inflation, gold isn't mm. really. Gold is stable because... Well, uh, there's just as much gold in the reserves as you've got. Mm. <laughs> what was the question? I'm sorry, I feel like I went on a, off on a tangent there. <laughs> I'm kind of trying to wonder where the, the value of diamonds are. And also, I don't think they're rare. You're right that like technology to find them means that they are being discovered at a stable rate and you could define them as rare. But actually, there are way more naturally made diamonds than there are synthetic diamonds. And they look the same. They have the exact chemical composition. Ah, so yeah, I see what you're saying. Why are the synthetic diamonds not worth more than the natural diamonds? They're rarer. They're beautiful. Is the beauty of a diamond, the value of a diamond, related to how old it is and the journey in which this rock has come from its inception to the consumer? <laughs> it's been made deep in the Earth's mantle. It's then been pumped up to the surface through liquid magma, and then somebody's found it, polished it up, cut it, delivered it to you in a lovely little box. Is that what the value is? No. Oh, yeah, I can just imagine my mum getting, and my dad getting down on one knee and her giving me that whole speech. Oh, a diamond. Think of its history. It just looks nice. Is that really what it is? Yeah. It just looks nice. And then if you say this is a synthetic diamond, people, people just don't like it as much. That's your answer. They've got no reason to like it, more or less. Just like when lab meat comes out, right? Laboratory-grown meat. People won't want that either. They'll want real meat. Just trust me. People just don't like. Things made in the lab. Yeah. Yeah, because you associate it with like a sterile environment. You, it's quite cold. I assume the mantle of Earth is pretty sterile. <laughs> My other question then, and I, I kind of know what you're going to say, but what do you think? Would you be happy with a synthetic diamond if you were in the market for one? Well, I wouldn't be happy to be missold one. Yes, that's exactly the case, right? Would you be happy with a diamond that you were told was natural, but actually it was synthetic? I wouldn't be happy paying natural diamond prices for a synthetic diamond if they're cheaper. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not really that I would mind one way or another, whether it was synthetic or natural, but I don't want to be ripped off about it. But would like you... you say, it's exactly the same. Get over yourself. Mm. Yeah. But if you were in the market for a diamond, you'd go synthetic all, all the way, would you? If they're cheaper, yeah. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd settle for cubic zirconia. <laughs> okay, you've got a cat, right? Uh, yes. Although she was, she was hit by a car. Oh, no. Just last week, so my, my parents were away, my brother lives at home, and he 
um, got a phone call from the vet and they said um, she's still alive at the moment. And he was like, oh, okay, thank you very much. And they said, phone back tomorrow. So he obviously phoned my, my parents and yeah, and they were like, oh God, okay, all right. No, nobody told me, by the way. Nobody told me. But then um, the next day, my brother phoned the vet again and they said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, she's no longer with us. Oh, no. We've sent her to another vet's. Oh, what? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! And so she went. She'd been sent to, a, I don't know, a specialist overnight or something. Yeah. And and when my brother went to go and see her, like the, that vet was like, "Oh yeah, she's totally fine." And she'd apparently <laughs> just been clipped by the car, and she's literally totally fine, bar like a little scratch on the top of her head. Well, that, <laughs> that, well, how thankful we can be for that, anyway, right? Yeah, no, I'm I'm very glad. People should not speed in residential areas. And uh, sorry, shouldn't speed full stop. But um yeah, we've we've actually lost a cat before um to that. So keep an eye on where you go in and keep to the speed limit. Mm. But go on, please talk to me about cats. So well, I still want to know more about your cat. What's her name? Clementine. Oh, uh, why did you call her that? I don't know really. She doesn't look like a Clementine. Not orange. No, she's white and got very odd, non-uniform black patches, kind of like a a cow, a Frisian cow. Yeah. So she, her name doesn't actually match her appearance at all. And we've never really done that. The last cat we had was called Roundtree and he was bonkers. Um, and then the one before that was called Julius and he was just a great... Although, as you know, he was named Julius because he looked like Julius Caesar and he was named at the um, Cats Protection where we got him from. Like, he was ah. quite stern, grumpy. He like Julius... Okay. Yeah, like in his um, little mug shot that they take, he looked really quite impressive, you know, quite <laughs> emperor-like. Um, and he was a very big cat, so quite imposing. Mm. But yeah, Clementine, called Clementine just because I think it's a pretty name. Hmm. We we also have a cat back at my childhood home. She's called Tess. Oh yeah. Uh, so the reason we called <clears throat> we called her Tess. This is an exclusive. I don't even think my family know this. But uh, Cat Dealey was a big star at the time. You know, do you remember <laughs> Cat Dealey? I remember Cat Dealey. Yeah. SMTV Live and that. Uh, yeah. I can't remember what else she does now, but I, I really fancied her. I was young. Did you? Yeah. I'd, oh, I did. You fancied Cat Dealey? Yeah. I think it's the Birmingham <laughs> thing. So, like, but obviously I couldn't suggest the name Cat because, you know, you can't name a cat Cat. So I thought that Tess Daly was, like, the next closest thing to Cat Daly in my head. So that's how <laughs> our cat got her name. Tess Daly, a completely different woman. Well, yeah, but a blonde TV presenter who I thought was also pretty but not quite Cat Daly. Mm, could have had Zoe Ball. Yeah. Um, Try and think of some more. That's probably it, actually. I think Tess is a good choice. Yeah, it went down well. It was never questioned. No one asked me where it had come from. So how's this for a question? Is naming pets of any consequence? No, not really. You're talking to a man who has had a lot of pets. Yeah. In my time, I've had a crazy amount. And I've given all of them names, I think. I can't think of a single one that I haven't given names. Even the two dwarf puffer fish I have are called Dwayne the Rock Johnson and the other one you can't really pronounce his name he's just represented by the fish emoji kind of like Prince was represented yeah. by the mm. love symbol nice I like that so we call him the artist formerly known as fish <laughs> and then I've had lots and lots of tree frogs and snakes and lizards and yeah I think I've given names to all of them I think it's quite a fun process yeah in in the um I don't want to say owning of an animal, because that sounds a bit messed up. But uh, it is just, what it is. L- yeah, it, <laughs> it is. Living with an animal, looking after an animal, it's nice to give them a human name and anthropomorphize them slightly. Oh, what, what, like the artist formerly known as Fish? How kind. Well, that's quite funny, I <laughs> yeah. think. Yeah. But I mean, you wouldn't have a dog and not name it, right? No, that's true. I guess it really depends on whether the animal in question can recognise its name or not, yeah. Mm, no, not for me, because things like snakes and fish, they don't recognise their names, and I would still yeah, name so, them. Yeah, so in that case, it's of no consequence whether you named it or not, yeah? So, like, I don't know whether I've mentioned it on the podcast, probably have. I had a little African clawed frog for 
the last few years called Baron Afalabi. Uh, and I, I can understand that he probably would have been all right without a name. He, I, I suspect he didn't know he had a name. Yeah, I, I see what you mean, yeah. Um, it's of no consequence. For us, it's quite amusing. For some of us, I guess it's quite cute. Yeah, it has no real consequence on those animals. Whereas a dog and a cat, they recognise their own names. Wow. So, oh. Does a cat. So dog owners would pretty uniformly agree that their pet can recognise their name, yeah? Uh, and dogs are definitely particularly good at it, but that isn't going to be a big surprise because they've been domesticated for a really long time, like somewhere between 20 and 40,000 years. They're a lot more vocal as well. Yeah. So uh, apparently a well-trained dog can differentiate up to a thousand human words. Wow. And have meaning for them. I'm guessing this is like police academy level rather than Crofts, but... <laughs> <laughs> I love Crofts. I missed it this year. Yeah. Well, maybe they can do a thousand different words there anyway. And there's lots of studies in the literature about how dogs have the ability to communicate with humans, like how they understand gestures like pointing or facial expressions. And there's also evidence to suggest that dogs like can specifically recognise their owners' voices as well. Uh, so outside of the dogs, there's evidence that apes, dolphins and parrots can all understand human verbalizations as well. And I'm sure that there's also like a load of anecdotal evidence in many more species. So as a little bit of additional anecdotal evidence for the literature, do you think that your cat can recognize her name? That's a really difficult question mm. because <laughs> Humans and dogs have such a different relationship to humans and cats in that a dog serves a purpose, is, is as you say, trained to almost assist the human in all sorts of tasks, whereas the cat is more parasitic in nature. Well, it catches mice. It catches mice. It does have that function, but the practical function that a cat serves, aside from like therapeutic purposes and also humans just being selfish and wanting to live with a fluffy creature those functions like catching mice don't really require any communication between yeah the cat would be killing birds and mice whether it was also living in your house or not right yeah and in my experience as well like if a cat wants to do that and you don't want it to do that like there's nothing you can do that cat <laughs> is going to keep on killing those animals and we've had cats in the past that have been a lot more malicious than our current one, who is lovely. But um, I would like to think that Clementine understands her name, but I also wouldn't be surprised to learn that she can't. Yeah, I genuinely don't know in Tessie's case either. Like, it is weird that we've lived with these animals, like in my case, for over a decade. And I still don't really know if she knows she's called Tess. Hmm. Like, if I, was, if I was trying to get attention from her, I'd do something like, Tess, pss, 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 pss. Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of sound. Yeah, and I don't know whether she's reacting to her name or, like, she just likes the... Pss, 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 pss. Oh, they never like the noise. Oh, pss, really? Pss, 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 pss. That's mine. It just never works. I don't think I've ever had a cat that comes when I call for it. Oh, de definitely with... Pss, 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 I can bring e many cats over, yeah. Really? I, I, all the listeners now are getting, like, tingling down the spines from the ASMR of this. <laughs> we've got to stop doing it i do do the noise yeah but i never really know if it actually works but you're saying that that it does work perhaps you do a different noise to me perhaps i need to change up my noise mm. I'll, I'll train you we'll see when when i go to the island i'll have a go on clementine yes of course Okay. So, so back to the news anyway. Some researchers at the University of Tokyo have been investigating this phenomenon, right? They visited some cat owners and they recorded them reading a list of five words. Uh, the first four words were just nouns with the same rhythm and length as the cat's name. And then the final word, word five, was the cat's name. Uh, so obviously I don't have examples because it's in Japanese, but... They then played back these recordings to the cats... And most of them responded at first, like classic cat stuff, you know, subtle moving of the head or the, the ears, so you can tell that they've heard something. But by the fourth word, they'd just stop listening completely and weren't showing any physical responses. So they, they become habituated to words the noise. being said, yeah. yeah. But when the owner said the fifth word, which was the cat's name, the response heightened again in nine out of 11 of the cats. 
Oh, okay. So close to being 9 out of 10 cats. <laughs> so this isn't really enough evidence to prove that cats know the names, though. Like, in that list of four nouns and then the word, they could just have a stronger response to their name because they're more familiar with it than the other words, yeah? So I can imagine Tess, if I said, like, oh, dinner, that would be one of her trigger words more than, oh, uh, cardigan. <laughs> Yeah, but is that not exactly what happens when dogs communicate with humans? They're just like, that's a word I hear often. They might not necessarily know that that's what they're called. They just know that that's a name that means let's communicate. Well, okay, so this is where experiment two might be a little bit more of a revelation. They went to some different cat households, but this time they were what are referred to as multi-cat households. They're homes with five or more cats per house. Bloody hell, that's a lot of cats. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so instead of just reading random nouns, this time the owners did a like a roll call of five of the cats' names, so in a row. This time, less of the cats started ignoring words, so only six out of the 24 reduced their physical responses as they went down the list. But all of those that started ignoring them always started again, started listening again when they read their own name. Sorry, say that again. Right, so <clears throat> you've got a list of five cats' names that you've got in your house. Yeah. You're going to have one of them. He's your experimental cat. So he's the one you're going to be reading to, and he's the fifth name on the list. Okay, yeah. Right, so you read name one, name two, name three. So most of the cats, 18 out of 24, they carried on listening as you were reading the names of the cats that lived in the house with them. Lots of reasons why that could be. So, like, when you're going around shouting your cats for dinner, you might shout them all at the same time or something, yeah? So, but the six that did start ignoring the human saying the list of names started listening again when their name was called. And they heard their name. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So this suggests it is something that they are recognising that, that this word is attached to them specifically. Mm. It, that suggests that a smaller proportion of them like can differentiate their name well they might just be interested right so if you're in a multi-cat household then you you might have attached significance to the names of all the cats you live with as well so you think oh well if she's calling jeff so she's probably got the dreamies out i'll go and investigate <laughs> yeah yeah they love dreamies oh they, oh they do so they did something similar as well in a cat cafe and found more evidence corroborating this. Like all of the different parts taken together, I think, come in like into a nice story of saying that, yeah, cats, cats can understand the names. They do know that you're talking to them, but they'll just ignore you and not show any response. Even the cats that were responding with the like minute ear movements and stuff like that's not what a dog would do, is it? No, the dog would get super excited. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's the thing that people with cats prefer about cats to dogs, isn't it? That mm. they are, they like that indifference, aloof. the cold indifference, mm. aloof, yeah. There's, there's an almost meanness of cats. They don't care. And that's, that's why I sort of described them as parasites earlier on, because they don't really bring much to the table, do they? Well, they bring birds. Yeah, only some of them do. Not Some of them don't do that. <laughs> And there, and for lots of people, the ones that don't bring birds to the table are the more desirable cats. I think more of them kill birds than you think, but some of them just don't bring them back. Then that's because they've got a lack of respect for you. Yeah. <laughs> Not even worth carrying this bird home for you. Where are my dreamies? We've talked about floating farms before, haven't we? Yeah. But it was more than just a floating farm when we talked about it. It was an all-in-one jobby. It was still a farm. It was agriculture, basically, wasn't it? And mm. catching catching fish as well. It was, I think, episode 16, if anybody wants to go and listen to that. And that was from very simple floating mats of vegetation in Bangladesh to, like you say, conceptual structures with more advanced technology, floating on the sea, catching fish underneath or farming fish underneath and growing crops above. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been following the floating technology train quite quite closely I'm going to call it float tech, if it's not already termed that. Uh, and there's been an advancement recently. Yeah. Farms are a little small fry, though, compared to this, because we're going big. We're going floating cities. Okay. Have you seen this? No. 
So the United Nations Human Settlements Programme, which is called UN Habitat, have partnered with MIT, uh, the Explorers Club, which is a science society, and the private company Oceanics to create Oceanics City, which is a resilient and sustainable floating community for 10,000 residents on 75 hectares of modular neighbourhoods, which are essentially floating hexagonal platforms anchored to the seabed. It's been marketed as a modular maritime metropolis, which I love, uh, with sustainability and community as its core values. And I adore the look of it. Do you want to see some concept yeah, art? Yeah, I do want to see it. I, I think I'm going to like it as well, but, you know. You, oh, I never know with you and pictures. I have my doubts. So this is their website and the pictures are at the very top. Mm. Oh, no, you're not impressed. Yeah, I mean, it looks all right. Just all right. A lot of wood. Yeah, we'll come to that. So how big are we talking for each of these little... Uh, Many islands. Yeah, so if you scroll down, you'll find the Oceanic City section. Okay, yeah. yeah and on, on the right-hand side, there's a graphic that shows how these platforms can be used together. So a single two-hectare platform is a neighbourhood, and then six of these combine together to form what they call a village. Yeah. And then six villages form a ring-shaped city with a sheltered harbour in the centre. Yeah, here's the thing, like... Two hectares mm -hmm. per neighbourhood, that's quite big. Like, to, to be covering up that much of the ocean or wherever it's going to go, like, what, there's stuff living there. What are you doing just building on the ocean? Have we not learned a lesson from building wherever the f*** we wanted on land? I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> that's all right. I'll beep it. Um, yeah, but the, the ocean, how much of the ocean is the surface of Earth? Earth's well, surface look. is covered by water. You can spare a two hectares, I'll give you that. Yeah, 71% of the Earth's surface is water covered. Not for long, if you keep going like this. Yeah, but still, 71% is quite significant. i tell you where I'd put it. On the plastic patch. <laughs> That'd be a nice picturesque location well, for it. Well, people are going to be chucking rubbish away, aren't they? Have they got a plan for waste disposal? They are, I think, working with um, some teams regarding waste disposal and, yeah, I guess things like that. Well, well that's not good enough. I don't know. I haven't looked into the waste disposal um, thing, but it is, it is a, obviously a, a key point. If, it's just, if they're saying it's sustainable and they've got no way to export this rubbish from the middle of the ocean... Okay, I won't talk about what I don't know. Okay. Uh, let me give you some That's examples of some of the... <laughs> let me give you some details that I do know. So the buildings are all quite low. They're seven stories maximum, and that helps to ensure a low centre of gravity for all of the platforms, so that I guess they don't get blown around and, um, I don't know, affected by winds or whatever. Yeah. Uh, their roofs, you will see in several of the pictures, they extend to provide areas of shade and also to form an area on top of the roofs for solar panels, which cover all of the top of the roofs. Mm. And then I think that also makes it kind of look from above quite like the sea surface as well, which I kind, kind of like from above, from an aerial perspective. It's, it doesn't look like it's taking up as much space as it actually is, which I guess is good for reflecting back into space and all sorts, you know. Just paint the roof white, as you suggested last week. Exactly, you could do that, but solar panels make sense to put on there. Residents are apparently encouraged or will be encouraged to engage in communal farming. So it's all about the community and whether that's for catching scallops underneath the platforms, um, or also things like kelp or other seafoods, um, or if it's fruit and vegetables on the platforms themselves, or even the um, fast-growing bamboo that they use in construction. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's all wood. Okay. So it's essentially, I think the plan is you put together one of these neighbourhoods or, or several of them together, maybe construct a little village, and then they grow more and more resources on them that they can then use to extend outwards. So it's like a city that grows depending on, the, I guess, the resources that it can produce, which I kind of like. Well, I mean, that's always been what cities have been until they decide that's not good enough. 
I guess the unique selling point here is that you're using sustainable materials that are grown within the village themselves. Yeah. That isn't how cities are built nowadays, is it? You get all sorts of materials traveling all over the world. I think that's what this is going to be. I don't know. I think that they're, they're really going for uh, carbon neutral, like sustainable. Yeah, to be fair, I have just looked at their waste systems and they do claim that they've got, an, they've got a plan for it. They're going to turn it to energy agricultural feedstock and recycled materials there you go that's clever isn't it mm-hmm. i mean if you turn it to energy by just burning it then that's i mean it's not great but it's better than yeah better than chucking it in the sea true mm, it's better than chucking it in the sea the most amazing thing about this the thing i like the most is that apparently the main obstacles holding it back are psychological rather than technological apparently just people don't like the idea of living on the water yeah and they don't like not being tethered to the land how do you feel about that? Well, I've always wanted to go on a canal boat holiday. Oh, me too. We need to do that. I know, yeah. Um, I could understand why people wouldn't like it. I mean, it doesn't look like there's going to be an airport. No, you probably have to get a boat there, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know. Or a flying plane. A flying plane. You know what I mean. A, a water plane. Yeah. I, I wouldn't... I think only weird people would move there at first, right? You know, the vegans. Vegans and hippies. They'd go, but... Then who, who'd want to join them? <laughs> Other vegans and hippies. Mm. I, I think it looks great. How are you going to qualify to get there? Do you have to pay? Maybe, yeah, perhaps. Give up all your worldly possessions to go and live on a floating thing in the middle of the sea. Mm. And, and just help each other. It sounds nice, but like, there's a reason it hasn't happened, isn't it? Well, yeah, and they think that it's psychological and financial barriers have prevented it from now. Yeah. The president of the Explorers Club says that perhaps uh, a way to build trust with the public is to extend existing cities. I I love it. I would, I I really think like forget extending cities. I want one in the middle of the Pacific, little okay. artificial island where we all work to build it up. There's and too much rubbish foods. there. Yeah, all right. Well, we can work on that as well. Perhaps we can take that, crush it down into diamonds. Yeah. Well, why not? If I could convince Bella of this idea, then I would pack my bags and I would go. Are they not trying to recruit people? Don't take this the wrong way, but are they not trying to recruit people with the skills for living in the middle of the ocean on their own? Well, I am from the Isle of Wight, Adam. (laughs) True, true. (laughs) It is just an island, isn't it? Yeah, but it's a self-sufficient island. Any communications people there, I'll be doing all their PR. Presumably they've got a Wi-Fi connection. I mean, how? It's going to be a smart city, isn't it? Just like any other. Yeah, no, I mean... We could still do the podcast. I'll be doing it from the middle of the Pacific. It'd be great. Yeah. You wouldn't be joining us, though. I, I mean, I'd go, I'd go and visit, but... Yeah. I'm not sure I would like it. Why? I don't think... I don't think they'd want me. You wouldn't be good for the community. No, I don't think so. I mean, no. I think... I don't know, actually. If everyone was doing it, I'd probably really get into it. I would... I'd love it. Wake up, it's sunny, you go outside, you can look at what you've built. They, it's marketing language, but they say leading the next frontier for human habitation. And it does feel like that. Like, Mm. surely we will start utilising all of the space on the ocean soon. And what about all the creatures that live in the ocean? What if a blue whale swims up to the side of your city, your floating city, and just like goes up underneath it? And sends sends your school over. <laughs> what about all the all the wildlife in the sea that you're going to be interrupting? How are you going to be interrupting the wildlife? Oh, because we we do we interrupt everywhere. So you'll have lights on this platform. I'm guessing. I'm guessing you're not going to go to sleep at whatever time the Earth tells you to. Mm, that's true. They don't like the artificial lights in the middle of the sea. They're not used to them. Hmm. I knew I'd find something that you uh, you agreed with eventually. You have found something. So you think we, sh- we just shouldn't encroach on the oceans with these floating cities? If they clean up the big plastic rubbish dump or just even compress it into a floating disc and build a city on it, yeah, fair enough, because we've already ruined that. So let's make that better. And if then we're showing, well, actually, the animals don't really care, which I think they would. But if they don't care, then then go ahead and build your your modular cities and try and sell 
socialism to people, even though that's not the point of it. If my mycoprotein idea takes off, I'll give you a bit of money for it. For the floating cities? Yeah. 